Hi, this is John Muncie, and today we're going to do a little Bible study together, and I want to talk about something I think is a very, very critical topic, uh, especially in the day and age in which we are living. I don't think I've ever talked about or dealt with a topic that, to me, generates more uh, of a difference of opinion and misunderstanding than the one that I'm going to talk about today. So I'm going to ask you to really allow me to really be able to speak straightforward to you about this and to be able to share with you some things that I'm going to call what the Bible plainly says about alcohol. Now, to start off, I'd like to ask you to just consider this for a second. When you look at contradictions in the scripture, how do you deal with it? I know that Personally, I have studied God's Word for over four decades, and I've come to the conclusion that every single time that we find a contradiction in the Scripture, it really boils down to something that we are doing that's causing this seemingly contradiction, and it's really our fault. And I think it's very clear that somehow we're not comprehending the truth that God is trying to get across. And I think that's why it's so important for us as believers to really take an honest look and to study, not just to superficially deal with an issue, but to take the time to dig into it. That's why uh, the Bible is not necessarily just a book that you just sit down and casually read, although there's nothing wrong with that. But the scripture actually encourages you to study it. That's why it tells us in 2 Timothy 2, 5, that we're to study the scripture so that we can end up rightly dividing the word of truth. And and obviously that is to take care of sometimes things that appear to be contradictory. And that is especially true on this subject of the use of the word wine. Now, I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. The scripture says wine is bad, but the scripture also says wine is good. Now, how in the world could you make those two different statements make sense? How could they agree? Um, Scripture tells us that wine brings a curse with it, but other places the scripture talks about wine being the blessings of God. There's places where the Bible says that wine causes the grief of heart, and yet other places where it talks about wine making the heart rejoice. And I'll show you some examples of these as we go on today. Uh, Other examples are wine leading to poverty, while other passages refer to wine being a sign of prosperity. Uh, These are all seemingly contradictions. How how are we going to get around that? Something very interesting is throughout the scripture, there are example after example of wine being a symbol of eternal wrath. However, other times it's used as a symbol of eternal salvation. How could this be so contradictory and yet using the same word wine? Wine brings woes and violence. However, the Bible also talks about wine bringing comfort and peace. Wine in the scripture is a source of ungodliness and sinful behavior, but at the same time, wine is a source of an acceptable offering to God. Now, how in the world can you make that gel together? Well, I think it's very obvious that we're talking about two entirely different types of wine. Now, if you will look at this honestly, you have to admit that while some scriptures apparently glorify wine and extol it, other scriptures absolutely undeniably rebuke it and condemn it. How come? Well, I think the problem lies very simple. I know this is going to sound overly simple, but it's because it's talking about two entirely different things. One type of wine mentioned in the Bible is a fermented alcoholic beverage which causes intoxication and has caused untold harm in our society and in every society where it's ever been. However, another type of wine is mentioned in the Bible being non-alcoholic grape juice. 
and it's associated with the healthy blessing of harvest and prosperity from the Lord. Now, as a result of that, I think it's very simple to to declare at this point, and I'm going to take time to dig in this a little deeper, that we're talking about two different things. Now, let me give you some examples of plain scriptures that associate wine with harvest time and that it's just the result of the fruit of harvest. For example, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 13, And he will love thee and bless thee and multiply thee. He will also bless the fruit of thy womb and the fruit of thy land, thy corn and thy wine and thy oil and the increase of thy kind and the flocks of thy sheep in the land which he sware unto thy father to give thee. Of course, this was part of God's blessing to the Jewish people as they were to inherit the promised land. And I want you to notice that in this passage, it refers to wine being a part of the blessing of the harvest. In Deuteronomy 11, verse 14, it says that I will give you the rain of your land in his due season, the first rain and the latter rain. Now watch this, that thou mayest gather in thy corn and thy wine and thy oil. Now I want you to notice that it's very clear from this passage that what is being referred to here is something that is harvested and it's called wine. However, it's obviously not an alcoholic drink. Now, I'll give you some <clears throat> some more examples of this in a moment, but let me give you another one just to kind of coincide with one I just gave you. Here in Second Chronicles 31.5, as soon as... As the commandment came abroad, the children of Israel brought in abundance the first fruit of corn, wine, and oil, and honey, and all the increase of the field. Now I want you to notice that in this case, <clears throat> this is a part of the, the, the offering, and the first fruits of that were obviously what was brought forth in the very first crop of this ripe harvest. Now, nobody in their right mind would immediately come to the conclusion that this is referring to some kind of alcoholic drink, even though it's coming from the harvest of the grape. Now, when you look at Jeremiah 31, verse 12, again, associating this all with harvest time, therefore they shall come and sing in the heights of Zion and shall overflow together for or to the goodness of the Lord for wheat, for wine, for oil, for the young of the flock and of the herd, and their soul shall be as watered gardens, and they shall not sorrow any more at all. Now notice all the association here is with wine, once again being a part of the blessings of the harvest time. Now here is one passage that is going to help us understand just how clearly this is referring to something that is non-alcoholic. Amos nine thirteen to 14. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper, and the treader of the grapes him that soweth seed. And the mountain shall drop sweet wine, and all the hills shall melt. Now, this is talking about the blessings of the Lord during the harvest time. And notice that the treader of grapes. <clears throat> now, obviously, this is what would happen when they would gather the grapes, grapes in. They would tread them and at the wine presses, and they would, as they would squeeze them, they would, as it says here, the, the mountains shall drop with sweet wine. In other words, it would just overflow. This is this is obviously, as you see in this picture here, what what you see displayed here is a, would be a biblical wine press. Now, what was going on when these treaders of grapes, as the scripture said, what were they treading out? What were they treading out? Well, the scripture makes it very clear that it was wine flowing from all this, and yet was it alcohol or was it just fresh? juice of the grapevine. And yet, what do we call these things? We call them wine presses, even though it's very obvious that it was not in any sense considered fermented. 
Proverbs 3, verses 9 to 10. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all, all thy increase. So shall thy barns be p- filled with plenty. Now watch this. And thy presses shall burst out with new wine. Now obviously as those wine presses were being squeezed of the grapes in them and they were bursting out with new wine. So let's let's be honest here. Are we to just automatically believe that what was coming out of those wine presses called new wine was an alcoholic beverage? Absolutely not. It's just simple grape juice. That's all it was. And yet <clears throat> you find this in Genesis chapter 40, verse 11, when uh, Joseph is giving the interpretation of a dream that the cupbearers have. And the, the cupbearers basically tell him the portion of the dream. And it says, And Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup, and I gave the cup unto Pharaoh's hand. So, in other words, what, what was Pharaoh drinking there was little more than just squeezed grapes. And it's just fresh grape juice, which obviously... Um, is what we would call today in, 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 in modern sense of the word just grape drink. Yet uh, in the Bible terminology, the word wine is used. And, and so sometimes it causes a misunderstanding because people immediately associate the word wine with alcohol. Now, would you think that anybody looking at this cluster of grapes that you see right now, would you mistaking this for alcohol. And yet the scripture calls this cluster of grapes hanging on the vine wine. It literally refers to this as being wine, even though it's still in the form of a grape. Inside, obviously, is the juice that you have to squeeze out. And yet here's what it says in Isaiah 65, verse 8, Thus saith the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and one say it destroys not, for a blessing is in it. Now, isn't it interesting, even the Lord refers to this as wine, even though it's still in the cluster hanging on the vine. Now, why am I going through all this? Well, because I don't think too many people today really understand the importance of uh, maybe associating these passages with their proper place. For example, immediately, if somebody says, do you believe in drinking wine? Most people immediately think of an uh, association with alcohol. Um, And yet, uh, scripturally, they'll say, well, the Bible talks about drinking wine. So therefore, conclusions are made, since I think wine today means alcohol, then wine must be alcohol in the scripture. Well, uh, you can go down to a typical grocery store and find non-alcoholic wine all, all the time. But you know what I thought was interesting is Dr. Thomas Welch, who was uh, a physician and a dentist by trade, had actually was one of the first ones to pasteurize uh, Concord grape juice And he did this to produce uh, a communion juice for uh, his church. And obviously it was the beginning of the processed food juice industry, which is very famous today. And there's obviously many of you that have uh, drank Welch's grape juice. It's fantastic. And it's very healthy and full of all kinds of tremendous blessings in it, just as the scripture referred to. And the greater majority of places that I have gone in churches that have communion services, will use Welch's grape juice. And really, it's very important because it's based on a biblical fact that even the Lord and his disciples during that communion, which we we do this, uh, the Lord's Supper, actually used non-fermented fruit of the vine. And I'll prove this in just a few minutes. But the reason why I'm sharing this with you is because Even the Lord himself, in using a parable in Mark chapter 2, refers to wine. But I want you to notice that in this whole verse, several times you're going to hear the word wine, but it's very obvious, unfermented, by the very fact of what the illustration 
is referring to. Let's read this passage closely. And no man putteth new wine into old old uh, bottles or wineskins, else the new wine doth burst the bottles. Now, obviously, they didn't have glass bottles. There he's referring to what we, is commonly known as wineskins, where they take skins of animals and they would put the the squeezed juice into these uh, skins. And obviously, as a result of fermentation, it would begin to expand the skins. And in this case, Jesus said you wouldn't put new wine, uh, which is unfermented, into wine skins that's already been stretched. Otherwise, once they're stretched out to the maximum amount, then as this continues to ferment, it would burst these wine skins. Let's read it again. It says, No man putteth new wine into old bottles, else the new wine doth burst the bottles, and the wine is spilled, and the bottles will be marred. But new wine is put into new bottles. Now, in every single one of those references, the Lord is referring to wine, and yet it's all, it's every one of them is referring to being unfermented. It's not gone through the process of fermentation, which would expand and burst. Now, <clears throat> Isn't it interesting that when you're reading the scripture and you read the word wine, that you would come to a conclusion that we're referring to alcohol, but in reality, we're not. The scripture uses the word wine to both define unfermented and fermented juice of grapes. Now, with that in mind, let me just share with you some other examples. Sometimes the same word we do this today uh, all the time. So it's not a big issue for us. We can understand stuff. For example, I've heard people say, wow, that church is on fire. And then somebody will say, that church is on fire. Well, even though you're using the exact same phrase, exact same words in the exact same sentence structure, the word fire in one sense, the word could be something good, whereas fire in the other sense could be something horrible. I mean, technically, you'd like to see your church on fire and being aggressively going after God and really, uh, you know, have a real burning zeal for the things of the Lord. But obviously, you wouldn't want your church to be burning in the sense that it's physically going to be destroyed. But we use the same phrase, the church is on fire. I'll give you another example. This one's a little humorous. The uh, the other day uh, we were watching some old uh, Flintstone DVDs in our family, and we we have a little machine that's got what's called a TV Guardian on it, and this TV Guardian will allow uh, profanity to be taken out of um, the DVD, and it's it's kind of a neat thing. But it was funny because we were all laughed because part of the song that's played at the beginning of each episode of the Flintstone, Flintstones is the phrase, we'll have a gay old time. Well, TV Guardian is set up so it will take out references to stuff such as gay or whatever because today the word gay has connotations that are totally ref- referring to homosexuality. Now, when I was growing up in the 60s when the... Flintstones were out. That song, no one associated the word gay with homosexuality. Uh, Back then, it was just referring to having a a, a fun time, a a good old time. Well, today, gay has no reference in people's mind to having fun or good. It's actually in references to homosexuality, which that's a whole other topic in and of itself. And yet everyone knows that this is true. We 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 do this all the time. Um, the word wine is literally an issue that has to do with meanings two different things. Uh, obviously, every time you read the word wine in the Bible, it is not referring to alcohol. So you hear Jesus drank wine. Well, If that's the case, then you'd say, well, it's okay for me to drink, which leads to hundreds of other issues and we'll deal with in just a moment. But sometimes the word wine simply refers to juice coming from a grape. And it's absolutely just referring to basically Welch's grape juice. Let's say, for example, if you look at the word story in the dictionary, 
uh, it, you get three different definitions. Uh, it's the telling of a happening, or it could mean a falsehood or a fib, or it could mean a section or a horizontal division of a building. So obvious difference of the word story is referring to different ways that it's used in a sentence. For example, I live on the third story doesn't mean the same thing as he told me an interesting story, even though it's the same word. The context then is what determines the meaning of that particular word. So it is in the Bible. We can tell where wine is referring to a non-alcoholic beverage or an alcoholic beverage by reading the context. And this is obviously one of the most important things of proper biblical interpretation is you have to put it in its proper context. And every time that the Bible refers to wine in the sense of alcohol, you can see it as it shows up in the context. And when it happens, it's very obvious that God shows the negative effects of wine and then gives warnings against it. For example, in the life of Noah. Now, some people may be shocked about this, but this is in the Bible, Genesis 9:21. It tells us that Noah drank of the wine because he had built it. Uh, he had he had actually uh, uh, made a uh, a vineyard, and he drank of the wine and was drunken. Now, this is clearly referring to uh, alcoholic beverage. He was drinking something that got him drunk. So, obviously, the word wine there is referring to alcohol. When you look at passages such as Proverbs 23, verse 31 to 32, it says, Look not thou upon the wine, when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. And notice why? Because at the, at the last, it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. That's why the scripture says, don't even look at it. Now think for just a minute, haven't we read already in this study that the Bible talks about wine being a blessing and wine being the product of the harvest time, and yet now the Scripture's telling us we shouldn't even look at it, much less drink it. When this, this is in the cup and it's moving about, in other words, it's, it's <clears throat> the fermentation is very obvious, don't even look at it. Look at this passage in Proverbs 20, verse 1, wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Now, isn't it amazing that this passage talks about wine being something that not only mocks you, but something that can actually deceive you? Now, I think that's very amazing when you see that in other passages, as we've shown some examples of this, Wine is looked at in a positive light. And I'm sure that if you've read the scripture, you know exactly what I'm talking about. However, here in America, alcohol has become our number one public enemy, causing us over $117 billion a year in damage and obviously disabling over a million people and claiming at least 100,000 lives and at least 25 times as many lives as all illegal drugs combined. And yet, for some reason, we can't see that the scripture is true when it's referring to wine is a mocker and it is a deceiver. I want you to think about this. What would happen if a packed 747 jumbo jet would crash once a week, every week, killing everybody aboard, and this would happen 52 weeks out of the year. What, what would you think would happen to uh, the whole airline industry? I mean, people would be warning and, and telling people, stay away from airplanes, et cetera, et cetera, and yet that's how many people die each week due to drunk driving. I want you to think about this. Every 30 minutes, someone is killed in an alcohol-related traffic accident. You take a typical weekend. Obviously, this is averaged out over a period of, of, of a year. 
an average of one teenager dies each hour in an automobile accident directly to, connected to alcohol. Now, I'm going to tell you something. The Bible means what it says when it says, don't even look at this stuff. It's a mocker. It's raging. And whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Did you know that alcohol is directly involved in 20% of all freezing deaths, 25% of all choking deaths? Alcohol is directly involved in 33% of all motor vehicle injuries. 34% of all child abuse cases are directly involved with alcohol. Think about that. 36% of all pedestrian deaths. Alcohol is directly involved in 40% of all divorces. 50% of all fractures. 50% of all rapes. 50% of all deaths from falls. 50% of all teenage motor vehicle deaths. Alcohol is directly involved in 52% of all fire deaths, 60% of all suicides, 64% of all murders. Think about this, folks. Alcohol is directly involved, 65% of all motorcycle crashes, 69% of all recreational boating injuries, 69% of all drownings. Alcohol is directly involved in 72% of all assaults and robberies, 76% of all recreational aircraft deaths. Alcohol is directly involved in 80% of all criminal court cases. And this is why, ladies and gentlemen, the Bible warns, don't look at it. Don't even look at this junk. Alcohol, wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. Whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. <clears throat> now, I want you to think about this, though. The very fact that it says that whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise shows us that there's a deception tied in with this. Did you know that alcohol is a major problem in the lives of millions of young people currently in our nation right now? And I think it is so sad because one of the reasons why is because the church is doing so little to address this this subject. And I can tell you, even from personal experience, going to church since I was a young man, and, and I remember just really going after God in my teenage years and growing up, and thank God I never had to get into alcohol, but I can never tell you of ever hearing the subject preached on in a sermon. Every once in a while, somebody would say something about it, but I never heard it being dealt with. Something this critical needs to be dealt with several times a year. However, the government is not afraid to, do the, to deal with this issue, and they've done several studies, one of which I want to share with you right now. They found that alcohol appeared in 93% of the top 200 most popular movies among young people. And 34% of the time, the alcohol was shown to be associated with wealth or luxury. And so as a result of that, people have in their mind, as they watch and see it being viewed, and this is why the Bible says don't look at it, don't, don't even look at it, but obviously when you're watching a movie, you're watching it, you're looking at it, and it's being portrayed in such a way. Alcohol appeared in 76% of all G and PG rated movies, 97% of all PG-13 rated movies. This is obviously from this governmental study. And 94% of all R rated movies. This was an amazing fact. When you start to think about this, then this same governmental study showed that about 150 of the most popular songs that were out during the time of the study, that 34% of them were having alcohol associated with sexual activity. And obviously, rap music was considered to be the the biggest offender of this with about three-fourths of the songs referring to substance abuse. But once again, remember what the scripture says, wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. Whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. 
You know, David Wilkerson wrote a book several years ago, and I'm sure there there are still copies available. And if you can get a, a copy of one, it would be a, a it would definitely be worth your while to read it. In this book, here's what he says. <clears throat> it's called Sipping Saints, by the way, which refers to drinking among uh, Christians. He says, a recent poll revealed that 81% of all Catholics now drink and 64% of all Protestants. These shocking figures keep mounting higher each month. The permissive attitude towards social drinking is fast creeping even into the most conservative evangelical church circles. And I can verify this as an evangelist as I travel across this country and I I speak a lot into mainline conservative fundamental Bible believing churches where church leadership, elders and deacons and pastors and youth pastors and Sunday school teachers and et cetera, et cetera, openly extol the fact that they believe in social drinking. And you would think this is incredible that this is happening. But one of the things that people will always say, but John, didn't Jesus turn water into wine and thereby giving them permission as they go out to drink or go out to, to a, a dinner to, to be able to drink with their meal? And uh, there are lots and lots of people who somehow associate, and I think this is due again to the programming technique of movies and commercials, that to have a good time, you got to drink. To be really celebrating, you got to be drinking alcohol. I mean, what you know? What's celebration without some champagne, or, or you know, what's romance without some wine? And obviously, that's that's come from a a particular programming technique, which is obviously the alcohol industry is trying to get across. But then, what what are you going to say about this? <clears throat> Didn't Jesus turn water into wine? Is what the Bible says. But here again. You've got to pay close attention. Just because it says alcohol does not necessarily mean it's refer. I'm, I'm sorry. Just because it says wine does not mean it's necessarily referring to alcohol. And I think to really be able to to prove this, we've got to really take a look at this story closely. Here's what it says in John chapter two. And there were. And by the way, the setting is it's 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 a a wedding. It's a wedding in Cana, and. Uh, <clears throat> Obviously, the weddings there sometimes would um, cover a matter of hours and even days. And uh, there would be huge times of celebration. And so Jesus and his disciples were invited to this wedding. And uh, long story short, uh, they, had, they had run out of wine. And so Mary had brought this up to the Lord. And make a long story short, this is where he performed his first miracle, turning water into wine. So let's get back to it now here in John chapter 2, starting in verse 6. And there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. So totaling all this together, you're talking about about 160 gallons that were in these six water pots. Now watch what happens. Jesus saith unto them, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. He saith unto them, draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast. In other words, draw it out and take it to the governor. And they bear it. Now, the question obviously has to be, since it says he turned water into wine, was Jesus serving alcohol? Now, think about this for a second. Would Jesus join forces with something that the Scriptures teaches emphatically that carries a warning of judgment for partaking in? You say, what are you talking about? In Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 15, it says, Woe unto him. Anytime you see the word woe, it's referring to a, a judgment call. Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink. And it goes on and describes that uh, this, is, this is referring to an alcoholic drink that will bring about some sexual stuff along with that. But anyway, it says, make sure that you understand there's a judgment on those that give your neighbor drink, strong drink. Now, 
I don't know how many have actually heard this before, but some people actually refer to alcohol or wine as Jesus juice and in a roundabout way, very mockingly referring to it because really what it's doing, it's bringing our precious Lord down to the level of a glorified distiller. And here's the thing, pastors and teachers and Sunday school teachers and youth leaders, et cetera, et cetera, have been going on for months and years teaching that, well, there's really nothing wrong with wine. Jesus served wine at the, at the wedding. And yet, here's the deal. Let's think about this for a second. Since one of the biggest destroyers of marriage and the home is alcohol, would Jesus bless this couple's marriage with this liquid destroyer? Think about this. Let's just, I want you to think about this statement for a second. Imagine the countless tens of thousands of marriages that are wrecked as a result of this every month. Would you imagine the Lord doing that? It just, it seems so out of character for him. So what I want us to do, I want us to use some common sense here. I want us to be fair and let's think this through with some reasonable logic. And I want you to do this first, really knowing the character of the Lord Jesus. And then second, knowing the character of alcohol. I mean, I want, I want us to be honest. And those of you that have used this as a as a, an excuse to get around and say, well, you know, Jesus drank wine because he drank it at the, at the wedding feast. Well, I, I want you to think about this for a second. Does this fit the character of the Lord and the character of alcohol? Now, for some of you, being honest sometimes is a hard thing, especially with this issue. This is why I said earlier on, this is so controversial, but let's take a look at this. Are we to believe that the Lord Jesus Christ and knowing his character, who he is and what he's all about, that the Lord Jesus would bring one of the leading causes of spousal abuse into the home of a newlywed couple on their wedding day? I mean, ask any woman with a drunken husband if alcohol has helped their marriage and their lives. Ask them and see if it makes sense to you. Imagine if this abusive husband now is standing before a judge uh, at the divorce court and he says, well, your honor, uh, you know, I couldn't help myself because, you know, the Lord Jesus blessed us with hundreds of gallons of alcohol after drinking so much, I really didn't know what I was doing. I mean, I didn't feel Jesus would give me something that would make me so bad. I mean, does that make sense to you? Does it even measure up to the character of the Lord. Let me ask you another question. Could you imagine the Lord Jesus putting young people and children into the temptation of alcohol by freely giving them gallons and gallons of alcohol? You've got to understand, at that wedding in Cana, it wasn't just all adults. There were the adults' kids. There were the their grandkids. There were there were little little ones there. There were teenagers there. There were there were people that were uh, preteens. Can you imagine that? Uh, knowing, f- first of all, the character of the Lord. Well, if the Lord would have tried to do that at, at a wedding here in America, he could have been arrested for it. Because it's illegal to give alcohol to someone underage. And yet we're thinking that somehow the Lord would do this, that he would give hundreds of gallons of alcohol freely distribute them among family and friends. By the way, did you know in Mark chapter 9, Jesus himself said in verse 42, that whosoever shall offend one of these little ones, the word offend there means to entice the sin. Whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were cast into the sea. Jesus is saying at this point that anybody that would trip a little one up and entice them to sin, it would be better for them to have been drowned, to have been a millstone tied around their neck. And I mean, that's something you'd see the mafia doing. I mean, it would be better for you to have some violent form of death than for you to do this. Could you imagine the Lord Jesus giving someone alcohol, knowing that Some people have a predisposition toward alcoholism. 
and that just one drink could push them over the line and cause them to sin, and not to mention others who are trying to quit, who could easily be drawn back into their addiction with just one small drink. Now, folks, this does, this doesn't sound right to me. It doesn't seem, it seems so out of character for the Lord. Because the fact is, studies have shown that 40% of everyone who uses alcohol develops serious drinking problems. I am here to tell you there's something wrong with that interpretation. Now, let's think this one through for a minute. In John chapter 2, verse 11, after performing this, the scripture says, And commenting about this miracle, this beginning of miracles, the Jesus in Cana of Galilee, and manifested forth his glory. That's a very important phrase. And manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. Now, obviously, the question is, would producing alcohol be a fitting way to start off the miracle ministry of the Lord Jesus? I have to say no. Does it sound a little strange to you that to manifest forth his glory could be done by giving men, women, boys, and girls alcohol a known drug? No, that doesn't sound right to me. Would this caused people to believe on him, just as it said the disciples did? And what would this lead them to believe about him? That God has changed his mind about wine being a mocker? Is it now okay to drink something that he said that we're not even to look upon? So obviously, there's a contradiction here, folks. And the contradiction is only because you and I have been guilty of not properly applying biblical context and interpretation to a teaching how could his glory be manifested by giving people something that has shattered more homes crippled more bodies separated more couples wounded more hearts shamed more men dishonored more women handicapped more children slain more teenagers wrecked more lives confused more minds stolen more dreams destroyed more futures silenced more voices and killed more people than any other drink known to man how in the world would that somehow manifest the glory of Jesus Christ it it's not the case The fact of the matter is, you can ask the battered and abused child if Jesus would give their daddy something that would cause him to turn into a hateful monster. And I think you'd get get the right answer. Explain to those boys and girls who've been raped or molested by a drinking relative if this is a good thing to give at a party. And I think you'll get the answer right. Now let's get back to the story here in John chapter 2. And I always thought this was interesting that the the Holy Spirit would inspire as he as John wrote this passage to include this particular uh conversation in the story. Now when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine. Now let's stop again and say this. Just because it says wine does not mean it's alcohol. Now let's stay with this for a second. And when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that had been that had that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, and by the way, notice it didn't say are well drunk, it just means that when men have filled themselves up with with the wine, then that which is worse. In other words, you know, normally he said, you know, when when this is normally done, you know, people would bring out the the uh, the the cheap first. I'm, I'm sorry, the better first, and then the cheap later. But you know, you've kept the good wine until now, and 
There's an amazing parallel in this and what I think uh, the Lord is trying to say about the value and the beauty of longevity in a marriage and how that, uh, and it's an example of what has happened in this particular miracle at Cana. And by the way, isn't it interesting, the very first miracle was performed in a wedding because that's the heart of God. God loves to see a man and a woman united. That was what he rejoiced about in the garden when Adam and Eve came together and he blessed that and 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 made it to be a wonderful thing of 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 being basically the ability to procreate and to add on and an illustration later on in the book of Ephesians of what the relationship of a husband and wife is just like Christ in the church so many beautiful illustrations here and yet <clears throat> I think it's interesting that the the longevity in this. In other words, it gets better as it goes on. And as anyone who stayed in their marriage and not fallen for the trick of divorce, the, the it gets better as it goes on. And this is what's happening here. But the reason why this is so important, this sentence and these two verses are put in there is because this by itself proves a very, very uh, important strike against this being fermented wine because of a very interesting observation. you got to understand, they've all now been filled up, they've drank well, and now the better has come out. But anyone who knows <clears throat> anything about wine knows that you, after drinking lots and lots of wine, you can't tell one quality from another. And uh, a wine taster will tell you that you don't just gulp down a drink after drink to taste wine, but you gently stir it, and then you smell it, and then you drink only a small sip so as not to deaden the taste buds. And that's, that's because after drinking so much, you, you, your, uh, your, your tongue doesn't have the ability to tell the difference between good and bad wine. Now think about that. Isn't that incredible that that's, those two verses are placed in there to reinforce the fact we're not talking about alcohol being served at that wedding. <clears throat> Another example, some people will bring up that, well, you know, they had alcohol at the Lord's Supper. No, they did not. You said, well, they served wine at, at the Last Supper. Well, the fact of the matter is you won't be able to find that in the Bible. Now let's take a look at Mark chapter 14 and read what it says. And as they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed and break it and gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Now, obviously, this is in reference to his body and blood being broken and shed for the sins of all mankind. And as an illustration, he takes the bread in the cup. Now, if you look at the passages, though, in every single gospel account, not one time does that cup being referred to, it's not even called wine. I mean, it's clearly referred to as something else. And let's look at it here in Mark chapter 14, verse 25. Verily I say unto you, now watch carefully what Jesus says. I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until the day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. I mean, there's not even a reference to it being called wine. But even if it was referred to as wine, you've got to understand, Jesus clearly says here, it's just the fruit of the vine. It's just like we read earlier in Isaiah. It's just juice squeezed from grapes and the fruit that's coming from the vine is grapes and it's the juice that's coming out of that by the way when the lord was doing this this was just so happened to fall on the time where they were su serving passover and passover was a time of just the opposite of fermentation but non-fermentation obviously Freshly squeezed juice was permitted because it had never been allowed to sit and ferment. This is why, for example, 
the Passover was a time of unleavened bread. There was no fermentation allowed in any form. And it represents the unleavened, unfermented, pure blood of Christ. I mean, think about this for an example. He is referring to the juice being like his blood and the the bread being like his body. He was without sin, the scripture says. And when you think about this in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 14, he's actually using an Old Testament reference where it says, and thou didst drink the pure blood of the grape. Now, isn't it interesting? It says the pure blood is obviously referring to the juice that that comes from the grape, but it's referred to the pure blood. In other words, the juice that was in that grape that was being illustrated of the blood of Christ would never be an uh, appropriate illustration of his blood if it had rotted, if it had allowed to become fermented, which is rot- rotten. He, that, the, how would that represent the blood of Christ? No, man, the, the blood of Jesus is pure and, and spotless and unfermented and unleavened. Now, with those two illustrations, I mean, we could go on and on with many of them, but I want to get to the real meat of this. So what does the Bible really say about alcohol? I mean, we have, you know, these so-called proof texts of this, but when you look at them, even obviously they're not referring to alcoholic drinks when it refers to wine. But what about passages that refer to wine? I mean, if you take a look at them, and what I want to do is I want you to look at these verses. And, and to be honest with you, no one can look at these following passages and not see that the Word of God deals very straightforwardly about the negative impact that alcohol has made on mankind. So what I want you to do is I want you to follow along with me as we look at these passages and see what the Scripture really teaches about alcohol. Let's start here in Genesis. This is the first time that we found alcohol, and we've already referred to it earlier, here in Genesis chapter 9 and verse 20 through 25. And what it is, is referring to the horrible impact that it has on a great man of God, Noah. I mean, disgrace and shame and even a curse followed this first mention of alcohol. Noah had been deceived by this intoxicating substance, he lays naked in a drunken stupor, and while passed out, his son Ham committed some type of sinful act upon him, thus bringing upon his descendants, Ham's descendants, a horrible curse. Now, and and let me just go back to this for a second. One of the first times you find the scripture referring to a particular topic, it's called the, the law of first reference. It's always very important to take note of it because it kind of sets the precedence for other references throughout the rest of Scripture. And this is true, though, even in the second example here in Genesis chapter 19, the second time the Bible refers to alcohol, starting at verse 30, going through verse 36, we find uh, it referring to uh, its drunkenness among Lot. While under the influence of alcohol, Lot ends up having sex with both of his daughters, and in turn, both of them becoming pregnant. And no doubt, hundreds of thousands of acts of rape and incest and homosexuality and various sexual sins have taken place under the influence of this conscious destroying liquid. Now think about this. God's word is not ashamed to expose even men of God who have fallen in its deception and shame. And that's why we have to address this. In Genesis chapter 27, verses 25 to 29, we find Isaac, after drinking wine, had li- was lied to and deceived by his own son. In Leviticus chapter 10, verses 8 to 11, we find an express command for the priests of God to not drink wine or strong drink while ministering and to illustrate the difference between the holy and the unholy, the clean and the unclean, and to teach God's standards to his people. 
In Numbers chapter 6, 1 to 3, speaks of those who took a special vow to be separated to God and were never to drink wine or strong drink. In Deuteronomy 21, 18 to 20, we find how being intoxicated with alcohol is associated with stubbornness and rebellion and disobedience in young people and how it brings dishonor and disgrace to parents. In Deuteronomy 29, 2 to 6, we read where the abstinence of alcohol had brought a about a better knowledge of God. In uh, Judges 13, 4 through 14, Samson's mother, an example to all expecting mothers, is repeatedly instructed to not drink wine nor other forms of alcohol. And you know, several studies have gone that confirm that pregnant women who drink even small amounts of alcohol can cause birth defects in their unborn children. This is known as fetal alcohol syndrome. Uh, and it's uh, so sad to think about the, the amount of children, little tiny infants and babies who have suffered from mental retardation and irreversible physical abnormalities, not to mention even the fact that many of these little babies will grow up, become alcoholics themselves because their mothers would not take a biblical stand to not drink alcohol. <clears throat> then in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 14 to 15, we learn of Samuel's mother, Hannah, another example for all mothers who practice total abstinence from alcohol. In 1 Samuel 25, verses 36 to 38, we read of Nabal, a rich man who dies at the end of a drunken spree. In 2 Samuel 11:13, we read of King David trying to cover up his sin of adultery with Bathsheba, used alcohol to deceive and lure Uriah into a trap. In 2 Samuel 13, 28 to 29, we read while in a drunken state, David's Son, his own son Abnon, uh, uh, was murdered by his own brother Absalom, <clears throat> while obviously being deceived by alcohol. In First Kings sixteen eight to ten, we read while King Elah was drinking himself drunk, one of his uh, captains conspired against and killed him. In First Kings twenty verses thirteen to twenty one, we read while Ben Hadad and thirty two other kings were drinking and getting drunk, a small band of men attacked the Syrians and slew a large number of their army. In Esther one five to twenty two, we read while under the influence of alcohol, the king tries to subject his wife to the lustful eyes of his drunken friends, which in the long run brought about needless separation and divorce of this royal couple. In Job 1, 13 to 19, we read of the children of Job drinking wine when they were suddenly raided and kidnapped by the Arabs. In Proverbs 20 and verse 1, as we referred to earlier, wine and strong drink is shown to be a mocker and scoffer of people, making them out to be fools, and at the same time it deceives them into thinking that they are able to handle it. In Proverbs 21, verse 17, we are warned that the love of, of alcohol leads to poverty. In Proverbs 23, verses 19 to 20, we are told that a wise young man will guide his heart away from the company of drunks. In Proverbs 23, verse 21, we are assured that the life of a drunk leads to poverty. Again, in Proverbs 23, verses 29 to 30, we are reminded that wine and other forms of alcohol produces anguish and sorrow and contentions and babbling and bloodshot eyes and needless wounds in a person's life. Again, in Proverbs 23 and verse 31, we are told not to even look upon an alcoholic drink. In Proverbs 23, verse 32, we are forewarned that the effects of alcohol will end up being like the strike and the bite of a deadly poisonous snake. In Proverbs 23, 33, we are told that alcohol draws the eyes and the heart toward perverse things. In Proverbs 23, verse 34, we're reminded that alcohol causes one to stagger about as a sailor tossed at sea. In Proverbs 23, 35, we see illustrated how alcohol causes one to become irresponsible and irrational and how it leads its victims into a state of denial. Again, in Proverbs 23, 35, 
We are reminded that alcohol becomes habit-forming and brings one into a self-destructive mode of living. In Proverbs 31, verses 4 and 5, uh, political and judicial leaders are told not to drink wine or other forms of alcohol so they will not corrupt and pervert law and justice. In Proverbs 31, 6 and 7, we find the only real Old Testament sanction for alcohol. And it was to be given as a form of a deadening pain, uh, obviously to deaden pain for those about to die and for those in deep clinical depression. And by the way, I think it's very obvious today that there's many other forms of medicines that are better. But here is your one only example that you're going to find that the Bible in any way seems to sanction alcohol. Now, that's very interesting because... You go on in Ecclesiastes 2, verses 3 to 11. You find that King Solomon shares some of his personal experiences of how alcohol brought him only emptiness into his life. Again, in Ecclesiastes 10, verse 17, a special blessing is promised to nations who have uh, political leaders who will turn away from drunkenness. In Isaiah 5, 11, A pronouncement of calamity and disaster is placed upon those who drink and become inflamed by alcohol. According to Isaiah 5, verses 11 to 13, drinking parties only lead to captivity and destruction of honorable people. According to Isaiah 5, 11 to 13, alcohol has caused the destruction of multitudes of people. It goes on to say that even hell has enlarged itself, literally enlarged itself, because of the multitudes of people descending into hell because of the consequences of alcohol. Again, in Isaiah 5 and verse 22, another pronouncement of calamity and disaster is placed upon those who boast in their consumption of alcohol and mixed drinks as they try to appear to be champions or heroes. And I think this is so sad when you consider how many young people watch football games or basketball games or baseball games and they'll break to the commercial and and in many cases they're they're alcohol commercials, and, in, and, and sometimes these kids look to these people as, as, as heroes, and obviously the way that uh, the commercials display the advertisement has made it to appear as if these people are the, uh, the happiest people and the, and the healthiest and the sexiest and the strongest and the most popular and the wealthiest, et cetera, et cetera. And even you, you see them in billboards or in magazine ads, and they're constantly giving off the image, as you see displayed here in these two magazine ads, that uh, it, it's associated with partying and, and, and sexuality and sensuality. And yet the Scripture warns against that. Again, in Isaiah 22, verses 12 to 13, we find that drinking alcohol develops fatalism in people's lives. In Isaiah 24, verse 9, it shows that drinking alcohol causes depression and bitterness. In Isaiah 28, verse 1, another pronouncement of calamity and disaster is placed on drunkards and those who have been overcome with wine. And then in verse 3, God warns that the drunkards in their pride will be trodden down. And then you skip down to verses 7 to 8, and we're told how even ministers have gone into error because of wine. When you look closely at this, the same passage here in Isaiah 28, we're told that ministers have become swallowed up and destroyed by the use of wine. And how that they've strayed out of the way because of their deception of the various forms of alcohol. And he, he's, Isaiah is referring to those that are, are ministers. Again, he refers here in the same passage in Isaiah 28, 7 and 8, that we're told how drinking alcohol brings ministers into spiritual blindness and how it causes them to stumble in their judicial responsibilities. And that we see the end results of drinking wine in various forms of alcohol is vomit and filthiness. Which, by the way, folks, is the really the only way that you can be honest about this. And how many times do you do you ever see it displayed that way? You never see uh, alcohol shown with people being sick and vomiting and and sticking their head down a toilet and just uh, barfing and having 
all these uh, negative effects? Absolutely not, because obviously it would give off a negative connotation, which obviously the world doesn't want that side. <clears throat> Again, in Isaiah 56, verses 10 through 12, a very strong rebu rebuke is given to pastors and spiritual leaders for their fixation and their use of various forms of alcohol. In Jeremiah 35, verses 5 to 8, and then in verse 14, God commended the father of a family for helping them take a stand against alcohol and for their commitment to total abstinence from it. Well, this is a remarkable uh, story. You need to check that out. In Ezekiel 44, verse 21, we read that one of the requirements for priests to minister before the Lord is to not drink wine. In Daniel 1, verse 5 and 8 and 16, we read of young Daniel and his three young companions who determined to not defile themselves by drinking alcohol. And would to God we had more young people that would take this stance, that would take a strong stance even in the midst of big, heavy-duty pressure. By the way, you read later on in Daniel chapter 5, verses 1 to 4, how King Belshazzar, Belshazzar had uh, started drinking, and he did this before hundreds of his people set in a horrible example for these other men and women to follow, which obviously they ended up doing. And he, and he becomes bold in his acts of mockery toward the things of God while under the influence of alcohol. And as a result, the people started to drink wine too, and they began to praise and worship the false gods. It, it tells us there in Daniel 5. Again, in Hosea chapter 3 and verse 1, God speaks of the adulterous woman who was a lover of wine. In Hosea 4.11, we find that sexual immorality and alcohol go hand in hand because they take away the heart, the Scripture teaches. Hosea 7.5, a, a king and his people are reproved because of drinking of alcohol. In Joel 1.5, drunkards and those drinking alcohol are told to wake up and weep and well because of their alcohol. In Joel 3.3, 3, we are told of people who would actually sell their children for alcohol so they might be able to drink more. And then the horrible connection of alcoholism and how it ends up making husbands and wives and obviously moms and dads do horrible things to one another and their families to continue this horrible act of, uh, of alcoholism in their lives. It's just a tragedy. But what we're talking about today is what the Bible plainly says about it. In Amos chapter 2, verse 8, it refers to drinking the wine of the condemned in the house of a false god. In Amos 2.12, a clear condemnation is pronounced against those who gave alcohol to people who have dedicated themselves to God. In Amos 4.1, it speaks of those who drank alcohol were the same who had oppressed the poor and crushed the needy. In Amos 6, 1 to 6, a judgment is placed on those who party and drink alcohol, which in turn caused them to become careless and unconcerned for the things of God. And name 1 verse 10, it records the sudden destruction of drunkards. In Habakkuk 2, 5 to 8, it speaks of a man because he committed sin, because he commits sin with wine, is called a proud man, a destroyer of his home and will never have his desire satisfied. Again, in Habakkuk chapter 2, 5 to 8, a whole nation will be heaped up with violence and blood because of the treacherous nature of alcohol. And I think that could be definitely applied to what we have in our own country here in America. In Habakkuk 2.15, a pronouncement of calamity and disaster is placed on anyone who gives someone alcohol. In Habakkuk 2.15-16, a person who, gives someone, uh, who gets someone drunk to shame them, God will see to it that they're also put to shame. Now in the New Testament, <clears throat> we see here in Matthew 24, Jesus is talking, verses 48 to 51, a clear warning is given to those who eat and drink with drunkards that they will not be ready for the, the coming of Christ and that their subsequent end will be torment in hell. Read that passage. It's very clear. Again, in Matthew 27, verses 33 to 34, and also a parallel passage in Mark 15, 23, during the time of the crucifixion of the Lord, 
Jesus was offered a mixed alcoholic drink to help deaden the pain of the crucifixion. Yet, now listen to this, folks, he immediately refused, clearly revealing his opinion of intoxicating drinks. You know, for those of you that think that Jesus was a, a casual drinker, that he was a social drinker, and then he went around drinking with people, what are you going to do with a verse like that? Of all the times that he was even permitted and allowed According to Old Testament statements, in this case, he refused to drink it. And if he was a casual drinker, why would he be so eminent against it? I think it's very obvious where their stance should be. Again, in Luke chapter 1 and verse 15, we learn that the greatness of John the Baptist was linked to his total abstinence of wine and other forms of alcohol. In Luke twelve forty five to 46, a strong warning is given to the drinking crowd and to the drunkards that they will be cut off and cast into hell. In Luke 21, 34 to 35, a stern warning is given to the drunkard that the coming of Christ will catch them unaware and that it will be like a trap to them. In Romans chapter 13, Verses 13 and 14, a command is given to walk in honesty and not to and in partying and drunkenness and sexual immorality and lust and to, quote, put on Christ and to give sin no opportunity in your life. Again, in Romans chapter 14 and verse 21, we're told how right it is for Christians not to drink wine because of the possibility of it causing others to stumble or to be offended or to be made weak in their personal struggle against alcohol. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 11, Christians are given a definite command to not even eat with someone who claims to be a believer or a drunkard. In 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 10, an absolutely explicit, clear-cut warning is given that no drunkard shall inherit the kingdom of God. And, and by the way, let me just say this, that you know, some people say, well, I'm not a big drunk, but let me ask you a question. How much uh, percentage do you need to be drunk before you're being considered a drunkard? How many times do you have to be drunk? I mean, this is uh, incredible that people say, well, you know, I just get drunk every once in a while. I'm no drunkard. But this is referring to just like all other acts. It, in that same passage, it refers to adultery or murder. I mean, how many, do you have to murder a bunch of people before you're actually qualified as a murderer? You understand what I'm trying to say? <clears throat> in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 20 to 29, we're told that being drunk has no place in the celebration of the Lord's Supper. But uh, it shows uh, a very obvious disrespect of what this whole thing is about to despise the body and the blood of the Lord in such a way is un unbelievable. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 to 21, we read that getting drunk is classified as a work of the flesh and will unquestionably keep one from inheriting the kingdom of God. In Ephesians 5, 18, a direct command is given to not be under the influence of alcohol. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 6 to 8, another command is given to the importance of being sober at all times and not drunk. And by the way, the word there, sober, if you look this up in the Vines Expository Dictionary of New Testament words, it means to be free from the influence of of intoxicants. In other words, you should not be drinking something that has intoxicating power to it. You are to be sober. In 1 uh, Timothy chapter 3, uh, a scripture that uh, is clearly referring to pastors, one of the obligations, requirements for a pastor is to be sober and not to drink wine. And by the way, with that in mind, as, as Paul is dealing with Timothy here in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 22 through 23, and this is all in, in context of keeping himself from the sins of others and keeping himself pure, Paul gives Timothy permission, now listen very carefully, to use a little wine for 
his health problems. He's referring to uh, his his stomach issues and a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. Now, isn't it interesting that people will use this passage to justify them going out and drinking at a at a dinner or getting drunk or or drinking at a party or whatever else? But I want you to notice a few little things about this statement. It says use a little wine. It didn't say drink a little wine. You say, well, why is that important? Because this is referring to medicinal purposes. You don't, you don't drink medicine. You use medicine. You use it. You take it. You don't drink it. It's something you use. And that's in the context of what Paul's saying here. He says, you know, use a little wine as a medicinal purpose. And there's obviously values to that for and as there is in other types of drugs there's a there's a a form of them that can be used properly again in titus chapter 1 uh, verses 5 to 7 one qualification for those chosen to be pastors includes not being given to wine and that phrase when you look this up is defined as not being a casual sitter before wine. In other words, no pastor should be a social drinker. You should never be a, a casual sitter before wine. In First Timothy chapter three, verses eight, verse eight, and then also Titus chapter two and verse three, uh, Paul, who has just advised young Timothy here to the use of little wine, and knows it said use of little wine, deacons. And other women, the older women that are t- teaching the younger women, were explicit, explicitly instructed to not be given to much wine. Obviously warning the potential of the misuse of it, which um, again has obvious purposes. But in this case, it's very clearly that this is to be, it's considered inappropriate in those that are in leadership without any doubt whatsoever. Again, in First Peter chapter four, verses three to four, we see how Christians are no longer to be a part of drinking alcohol, which leads to sexual enticements and lusts and wild parties and even idolatry. Now, to be honest with you, we have tried to cover uh, the 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 mad, major part portions of the scripture. And I don't think anybody who has been honest with these passages will have any doubt where the Bible stands and therefore where a Bible believer should stand on the issue of alcohol. I think it's very obvious where we should stand, and I think that is that we should stand in opposition to it. You know what we need today in America is another Billy Sunday. Would to God we had a preacher like this great preacher of the gospel. He, um, his testimony is quite amazing, and I'm sure if you'd like to find out more about him, there are several books and obviously websites you can go to and read his amazing story. But he became one of the great uh, evangelists uh, at the turn of the 20th century. But I want to read to you just some of his statements. <clears throat> He's, and I'm quoting him now. He says, I am the sworn eternal and uncompromising enemy of the liquor traffic. I have been and will go on fighting that damnable, dirty, rotten business with all the power at my command. And I'm reading them thinking, wow, what would happen if we could get pastors and evangelists and and TV ministers to take a stand against this damnable, dirty, rotten business of the alcohol industry of our day. He went on to say in another sermon, he says, as long as I've got a foot, I'll kick it. As long as I've got a fist, I'll hit it. As long as I've got a tooth, I'll bite it. And when I'm footless and fistless and toothless, I will gum it till I go to heaven and it goes to hell. And boy, that's the kind of character we need today when it comes to dealing with this issue of alcohol. You know, we today should hate this rotten thing, this drink that has destroyed millions and millions of precious lives all around us. There's not a community that's not affected 
by it. There's not a, a neighborhood. There's not a business. Uh, it's everywhere you go where people work and where kids go to school and colleges. And it's amazing because it, what it does is it keeps people bound up and destroyed. But I'm thankful to God that in John chapter 8, verse 36, Jesus himself says these words, If the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. And I want you, if possibly you're watching this and listening to this right now, and maybe under the, 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 the bondage of what alcohol has done in your own life, to understand there is freedom. There is freedom in Jesus Christ. And the Bible makes it clear, and the Lord saying it, if the Son of God, if Jesus makes you free, if you've been set free f- from this, you are truly free. You're free indeed. You're truly free. And I want to ask you, would you right now turn to Him and to ask Him to set you free, to give you that freedom, to make you free indeed from its bondage? Even if you've just began to, to give in to it and you're already seeing yourself becoming more and more prone to it, can I ask you, friend, to repent and turn from it and ask the Lord to give you that freedom that he promises? I want to wrap this up by giving you an interesting poem that uh, I read years ago. And it was called, Let's Go to the Bar. I want you to listen to this. Whoever named it, named it well. A bar to heaven, a door to hell. A bar to manliness and wealth. A door to poverty and broken health. A bar to honor, respect and fame. The, a door to grief, sin and shame. A bar to hope a bar to prayer, a door to darkness, a door to despair, a bar to an honored, useful life, a door to fighting and senseless strife, a bar to all that is true and brave, a door to every drunkard's grave, a bar to joys that home imparts, a door to tears and aching hearts, a bar to heaven, a door to hell. Whoever named it, named it well. And I want you to think about that next time somebody invites you to go with them to the bar because that's what it's done. It's barred many. Barred many from many, many great things. And worst of all, think about this. and Barred people from eternity with the Lord. But that's obviously not the will of God. The Bible says that God loved the world so much that he sent his only son to bleed and die, to pay a death, a horrible death, through his bloodshed and through his death that has given us the ability to come to him and receive forgiveness for our sin and the power to say no. I trust this has been a blessing and a help to you. And if there's any way that we can further help and to answer questions, please don't hesitate to visit our website at johnmuncie.com. And, of course, you can email us at johnmuncie at aol.com. God bless you.